A princely state, also called native state, feudatory state or Indian state for those states on the subcontinent, was a vassal state under a local or regional ruler in a subsidiary alliance with the British Raj. Though the history of the princely states of the subcontinent dates from at least the classical period of Indian history, the predominant usage of the term princely state specifically refers to a semi-sovereign principality on the Indian subcontinent during the British Raj that was not directly governed by the British, but rather by a local ruler, subject to a form of indirect rule on some matters. In actual fact, the imprecise doctrine of paramountcy allowed the government of British India to interfere in the internal affairs of princely states and edict laws that applied to all of India when it deemed it necessary. At the time of the British withdrawal, 565 princely states were officially recognised in the Indian subcontinent, apart from thousands of Thakurs, Talukdars, Zamindaris and Jaggers. In 1947, princely states covered 40% of area of pre-independent India and constituted 23% of its population. The most important states had their own British political residencies, Hyderabad, Mysore and Travancore in the south followed by Jammu and Kashmir and Sikkim in the Himalayas, and Indore in central India. The most prominent among those, roughly a quarter of the total, had the status of a salute state, one whose ruler was entitled to a set number of gun salutes on ceremonial occasions. The princely states varied greatly in status, size, and wealth. The premier 21 gun salute states of Hyderabad, Jammu, and Kashmir were each over 200,000 square kilometers in size. In 1941, Hyderabad had a population of over 16 million, while Jammu and Kashmir had a population of slightly over 4 million. At the other end of the scale, the non-salute principality of Lawa covered an area of 49 square kilometers, with a population of just below 3,000. Some 200 of the lesser states had an area of less than 25 square kilometers, 10 square miles. The era of the princely states effectively ended with Indian independence in 1947. By 1950, almost all of the principalities had acceded to either India or Pakistan. The accession process was largely peaceful, except in the cases of Jammu and Kashmir whose ruler opted for independence but decided to accede to India following an invasion by Pakistan-based forces, Hyderabad whose ruler opted for independence in 1947, followed a year later by the police action and annexation of the state by India, Junagadh whose ruler acceded to Pakistan, but was annexed by India, and Khalid whose ruler declared independence in 1947, followed in 1948 by the state's annexation. As per the terms of accession, the erstwhile Indian princes received privy purses government allowances, and initially retained their statuses, privileges, and autonomy in internal matters during a transitional period which lasted until 1956. During this time, the former princely states were merged into unions, each of which was headed by a former ruling prince with the title of Rajpramukh ruling chief, equivalent to a state governor. In 1956, the position of Rajpramukh was abolished and the federations dissolved, the former principalities becoming part of Indian states. The states which acceded to Pakistan retained their status until the promulgation of a new constitution in 1956, when most became part of the province of West Pakistan. A few of the former states retained their autonomy until 1969 when they were fully integrated into Pakistan. The Indian government formally derecognized the princely families in 1971, followed by the government of Pakistan in 1972. Topic: History. Though principalities and chiefdoms existed on the Indian subcontinent from at least the Iron Age, the history of princely states on the Indian subcontinent dates to at least the 5th-6th centuries CE, during the rise of the Middle Kingdoms of India following the collapse of the Gupta Empire. Many of the future ruling clan groups, notably the Rajputs, began to emerge during this period. By the 13th 14th centuries, many of the Rajput clans had firmly established semi independent principalities in the northwest, along with several in the northeast. The widespread expansion of Islam during this time brought many principalities into tributary relations with Islamic sultanates, notably the Delhi Sultanate and Bahmani Sultanate. In the south, however, the Hindu Vijayanagara Empire remained dominant until the mid 17th century. Among its tributaries was the future Mysore Kingdom. The Turko Mongol Mughal Empire brought a majority of the existing Indian kingdoms and principalities under its suzerainty by the 17th century, beginning with its foundation in the early 16th century. 
The advent of Sikhism resulted in the Jat Sikh creation of the Sikh Empire in the north by the early 18th century, by which time the Mughal Empire was in full decline. At the same time, the Marathas carved out their own states to form the Maratha Empire. Through the 18th century, former Mughal governors formed their own independent states. In the northwest, some of those, such as Tonk, allied themselves with various groups, including the Marathas and the Durrani Empire, itself formed in 1747 from a loose agglomeration of tribal chiefdoms that composed former Mughal territories. In 1768, Prithvi Narayan Shah, ruler of a small principality in Gorkha likewise established the Kingdom of Nepal from a federation of small states, expanding its influence over much of northeastern India. In the south, the principalities of Hyderabad and Arcot were fully established by the 1760s, though they nominally remained vassals of the Mughal emperor. Topic: <laughs> British relationship with the princely states. India under the British Raj the Indian Empire consisted of two types of territory British India and the native states or princely states in its interpretation act 1889 the british parliament adopted the following definitions for the expression british india shall mean all territories and places within her majesty's dominions which are for the time being governed by her majesty through the governor general of india or through any governor or other officer subordinate to the governor general of india 5 the expression india shall mean british india together with any territories of any native prince or chief under the suzerainty of her majesty exercised through the governor general of india or through any governor or other officer subordinate to the governor general of india in general the term British India had been used and is still used also to refer to the regions under the rule of the East India Company in India from 1774 to 1858 the term has also been used to refer to the British in India the British Crown's suzerainty over 175 princely states, generally the largest and most important, was exercised in the name of the British Crown by the Central Government of British India under the Viceroy. The remaining approximately 400 states were influenced by agents answerable to the provincial governments of British India under a Governor, Lieutenant Governor, or Chief Commissioner. A clear distinction between Dominion and Suzerainty was supplied by the jurisdiction of the courts of law, the law of British India rested upon the legislation enacted by the British Parliament, and the legislative powers those laws vested in the various governments of British India, both central and local. In contrast, the courts of the princely states existed under the authority of the respective rulers of those states. Topic princely status and titles The Indian rulers bore various titles, including Chhatrapati exclusively used by the three Bonsal dynasty of the Marathas Emperor, Maharaja or Raja King, Sultan, Nawab, Amir, Rajay, Nizam, Wadiyar by the Maharajas of Mysore, Agnaraj Maharaj for the rulers of Badayan Raj, Chogil, Nawab Governor, Nayak, Wali, Inamdar, Sarangjamdar and many others. Whatever the literal meaning and traditional prestige of the ruler's actual title, the British government translated them all as prince, to avoid the implication that the native rulers could be kings with status equal to that of the British monarch. More prestigious Hindu rulers mostly existing before the Mughal Empire, or having split from such old states often used the title Raja, Rajay or a variant such as Rai, Rana, Rao, Rawat or Rawal. Also in this class were several Thakurs or Thai Ors and a few particular titles, such as Sardar, Mankari or Mankari, Mankari, Deshmukh, Sar Desai, Raja Inamdar, Sarangjamdar. The most prestigious Hindu rulers usually had the prefix Maha great, compare for example Grand Duke in their titles, as in Maharaja, Maharana, Maharao, etc. The states of Travancore and Cochin had queens regnant styled Maharani, generally the female forms applied only to sisters, spouses and widows, who could however act as regents. There were also compound titles, such as Maha Rajadiraj, Raj I Rajgan, often relics from an elaborate system of hierarchical titles under the Mughal emperors. For example, the addition of the adjective Bahadur raised the status of the titleholder one level. Furthermore, most dynasties used a variety of additional titles, such as Varma in South India. This should not be confused with various titles and suffixes not specific to princes but used by entire sub-castes. 
The Sikh princes concentrated at Punjab usually adopted Hindu type titles when attaining princely rank, at a lower level Sardar was used. Muslim rulers almost all used the title Nawab, the Arabic honorific of Naib, deputy, used of the Mughal governors, who became de facto autonomous with the decline of the Mughal Empire, with the prominent exceptions of the Nizam of Hyderabad and Berar, the Wali, Khan of Khalid, and the Wali of Swat. Other less usual titles included Darbar Sahib, Dewan, Jam, Metar unique to Chitral, and Mir from Amir. Topic precedence and prestige However, the actual importance of a princely state cannot be read from the title of its ruler, which was usually granted or at least recognized as a favor, often in recognition for loyalty and services rendered to the Mughal Empire. Although some titles were raised once or even repeatedly, there was no automatic updating when a state gained or lost real power. In fact, princely titles were even awarded to holders of domains mainly jaggers and even to lukars and zamindars tax collectors, which were not states at all. Various sources give significantly different numbers of states and domains of the various types. Even in general, the definition of titles and domains are clearly not well established. In addition to their titles all princely rulers were eligible to be appointed to certain British orders of chivalry associated with India, the most exalted order of the Star of India and the most eminent order of the Indian Empire. Women could be appointed as knights instead of dames of these orders. Rulers entitled to 21 gun and 19 gun salutes were normally appointed to the highest rank, Knight Grand Commander of the Order of the Star of India. Many Indian princes served in the British Army, the Indian Army, or in local guard or police forces, often rising to high ranks, some even served while on the throne. Many of these were appointed as an aide-de-camp, either to the ruling prince of their own house in the case of relatives of such rulers or indeed to the British King Emperor. Many saw active service, both on the subcontinent and on other fronts, during both world wars. Apart from those members of the princely houses who entered military service and who distinguished themselves, a good number of princes received honorary ranks as officers in the British and Indian armed forces. Those ranks were conferred based on several factors, including their heritage, lineage, gun salute or lack of one as well as personal character or martial traditions. After the First and Second World Wars, the princely rulers of several of the major states, including Gwalior, Patiala, Naba, Faridkot, Bikaner, Jaipur, Jodhpur, Jammu and Kashmir and Hyderabad, were given honorary general officer ranks as a result of their state's contributions to the war effort. Lieutenant, Captain, Flight Lieutenant or Lieutenant Commander, Major, Squadron Leader for junior members of princely houses or for minor princes Commander, Lieutenant Colonel, Wing Commander or Captain, Colonel, Group Captain granted to princes of salute states, often to those entitled to 15 guns or more Commodore, Brigadier, Air Commodore conferred upon princes of salute states entitled to gun salutes of 15 guns or more Major General, Air Vice Marshal conferred upon princes of salute states entitled to 15 guns or more conferred upon rulers of the major princely states, including Baroda, Kapurtala, Travancore, Bhopal and Mysore Lieutenant General conferred upon the rulers of the largest and most prominent princely houses after the First and Second World Wars for their state's contributions to the war effort, General very rarely awarded, the Maharajas of Gwalior and Jammu and Kashmir were created honorary generals in the British Army in 1877, the Maharaja of Bikaner was made one in 1937, and the Nizam of Hyderabad in 1941, it was also not unusual for members of princely houses to be appointed to various colonial offices, often far from their native state, or to enter the diplomatic corps. Salute <inaudible> 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 states The gun salute system was used to set unambiguously the precedence of the major rulers in the area in which the British East India Company was active, or generally of the states and their dynasties. As heads of a state, certain princely rulers were entitled to be saluted by the firing of an odd number of guns between 3 and 21, with a greater number of guns indicating greater prestige. Generally, the number of guns remained the same for all successive rulers of a particular state, but individual princes were sometimes granted additional guns on a personal basis. Furthermore, rulers were sometimes granted additional gun salutes within their own territories only, constituting a semi-promotion. The states of all these rulers about 120 were known as salute states. 
After Indian independence, the Maharana of Udaipur displaced the Nizam of Hyderabad as the most senior prince in India, because Hyderabad state had not acceded to the new dominion of India, and the style highness was extended to all rulers entitled to nine gun salutes. When the princely states had been integrated into the Indian Union their rulers were promised continued privileges and an income known as the privy purse for their upkeep. Subsequently, when the Indian government abolished the privy purse in 1971, the whole princely order ceased to be recognized under Indian law, although many families continue to retain their social prestige informally. Some descendants of the rulers are still prominent in regional or national politics, diplomacy, business and high society. At the time of Indian independence, only five rulers, the Nizam of Hyderabad, the Maharaja of Mysore, the Maharaja of Jammu and Kashmir state, the Maharaja Gaekwad of Baroda and the Maharaja Sindhya of Gwalior, were entitled to a 21-gun salute. Five more, the Nawab of Bhopal, H. H. the Maharaja of Bharatpur, the Maharaja Holkar of Indore, the Maharana of Udaipur, the Maharaja of Kolhapur, H. H. the Maharaja of Patiala and the Maharaja of Travancore, were entitled to 19 gun salutes. The most senior princely ruler was the Nizam of Hyderabad, who was entitled to the unique style Exalted Highness and 21 gun salute. Other princely rulers entitled to salutes of 11 guns, soon nine guns too, or more were entitled to the style Highness. No special style was used by rulers entitled to lesser gun salutes. As paramount ruler, and successor to the Mughals, the British King Emperor of India, for whom the style of majesty was reserved, was entitled to an imperial 101 gun salute in the European tradition, also the number of guns fired to announce the birth of an heir male to the throne. Non salute states There was no strict correlation between the levels of the titles and the classes of gun salutes, the real measure of precedence, but merely a growing percentage of higher titles in classes with more guns. As a rule the majority of gun salute princes had at least nine, with numbers below that usually the prerogative of Arab sheikhs of the Aden Protectorate, also under British protection. There were many so-called non-salute states of lower prestige. Since the total of salute states was 117 and there were more than 500 princely states, most rulers were not entitled to any gun salute. Not all of these were minor rulers. Serguha state, for example, was both larger and more populous than Karauli state, but the Maharaja of Karauli was entitled to a 17 gun salute and the Maharaja of Serguha was not entitled to any gun salute at all. A number of princes, in the broadest sense of the term, were not even acknowledged as such. On the other hand, the dynasties of certain defunct states were allowed to keep their princely status, they were known as political pensioners, such as the Nawab of Oudh. There were also certain estates of British India which were rendered as political saranjams, having equal princely status. Though none of these princes were awarded gun salutes, princely titles in this category were recognized as a form of vassals of salute states, and were not even in direct relation with the paramount power. Doctrine of lapse A controversial aspect of East India Company rule was the doctrine of lapse, a policy under which lands whose feudal ruler died or otherwise became unfit to rule without a male biological heir as opposed to an adopted son would become directly controlled by the company and an adopted son would not become the ruler of the princely state. This policy went counter to Indian tradition where, unlike Europe, it was far more the accepted norm for a ruler to appoint his own heir. The doctrine of lapse was pursued most vigorously by the Governor-General Sir James Ramsay, 10th Earl later First Marquess of Dalhousie. Dalhousie annexed seven states, including Awa Oudh, whose Nawabs he had accused of misrule, and the Maratha states of Nagpur, Jhansi and Sitara and Sambalpur and Thanjavur. Resentment over the annexation of these states turned to indignation when the heirlooms of the Maharajas of Nagpur were auctioned off in Calcutta. Dalhousie's actions contributed to the rising discontent amongst the upper castes which played a large part in the outbreak of the Indian Mutiny of 1857. The last Mughal Badshah emperor, whom many of the mutineers saw as a figurehead to rally around, was deposed following its suppression. In response to the unpopularity of the doctrine, it was discontinued with the end of company rule and the British Parliament's assumption of direct power over India.
Topic: <laughs> Imperial governance. By treaty, the British controlled the external affairs of the princely states absolutely. As the states were not British possessions, they retained control over their own internal affairs, subject to a degree of British influence which in many states was substantial. By the beginning of the 20th century, relations between the British and the four largest states, Hyderabad, Mysore, Jammu and Kashmir, and Baroda, were directly under the control of the Governor-General of India, in the person of a British resident. Two agencies, for Rajputana and Central India, oversaw 20 and 148 princely states respectively. The remaining princely states had their own British political officers, or agents, who answered to the administrators of India's provinces. The agents of five princely states were then under the authority of Madras, 354 under Bombay, 26 of Bengal, 2 under Assam, 34 under Punjab, 15 under Central Provinces and Berar and 2 under United Provinces. The Chamber of Princes Narendra Mandal or Narendra Mandal was an institution established in 1920 by a royal proclamation of the King Emperor to provide a forum in which the rulers could voice their needs and aspirations to the government. It survived until the end of the British Raj in 1947. By the early 1930s, most of the princely states whose agencies were under the authority of India's provinces were organised into new agencies, answerable directly to the Governor General, on the model of the Central India and Rajputana agencies, the Eastern States Agency, Punjab States Agency, Baluchistan Agency, Deccan States Agency, Madras States Agency, and the Northwest Frontier States Agency. The Baroda Residency was combined with the princely states of Northern Bombay Presidency into the Baroda, Western India and Gujarat States Agency. Gwalior was separated from the Central India Agency and given its own resident, and the states of Rampur and Benares, formerly with agents under the authority of the United Provinces, were placed under the Gwalior Residency in 1936. The princely states of Sandar and Banganapal in Mysore Presidency were transferred to the agency of the Mysore resident in 1939. Topic: Principal princely states in 1947. The native states in 1947 included five large states that were in direct political relations with the government of India. For the complete list of princely states in 1947, see List of princely states of India. Topic. In direct relations with the central government Central India Agency, Gwalior Residency, Baluchistan Agency, Rajputana Agency, Eastern States Agency Other states under provincial governments Burma Burma 52 states. State military forces See article, Indian state forces The armies of the native states were bound by many restrictions that were imposed by subsidiary alliances. They existed mainly for ceremonial use and for internal policing, although certain units designated as imperial service troops, were available for service alongside the regular Indian army upon request by the British government. According to the Imperial Gazetteer of India Vol. 4 1907, p. 85, since a chief can neither attack his neighbour nor fall out with a foreign nation, it follows that he needs no military establishment which is not required either for police purposes or personal display, or for cooperation with the Imperial Government. The treaty made with Gwalior in 1844, and the instrument of transfer given to Mysore in 1881, alike base the restriction of the forces of the state upon the broad ground of protection. The former explained in detail that unnecessary armies were embarrassing to the state itself and the cause of disquietude to others. A few months later, a striking proof of this was afforded by the army of the Sikh Kingdom of Lahore. The British government has undertaken to protect the dominions of the native princes from invasion and even from rebellion within. Its army is organised for the defence not merely of British India, but of all the possessions under the suzerainty of the King Emperor. In addition, other restrictions were imposed. The treaties with most of the larger states are clear on this point. 
Posts in the interior must not be fortified, factories for the production of guns and ammunition must not be constructed, nor may the subject of other states be enlisted in the local forces. They must allow the forces that defend them to obtain local supplies, to occupy cantonments or positions, and to arrest deserters, and in addition to these services they must recognize the imperial control of the railways, telegraphs, and postal communications as essential not only to the common welfare but to the common defense. The imperial service troops were routinely inspected by British army officers and generally had the same equipment as soldiers in the Indian army. Although their numbers were relatively small, the Imperial Service troops were employed in China and British Somaliland in the first decade of the 20th century, and later saw action in the First World War and Second World War. <laughs> Political integration of princely states in 1947 and after India At the time of Indian independence in August 1947, India was divided into two sets of territories, the first being the territories of British India, which were under the direct control of the India Office in London and the Governor General of India, and the second being the princely states, the territories over which the Crown had suzerainty, but which were under the control of their hereditary rulers. In addition, there were several colonial enclaves controlled by France and Portugal. The integration of these territories into Dominion of India, that had been created by the Indian Independence Act 1947 by the British Parliament, was a declared objective of the Indian National Congress, which the Government of India pursued over the years 1947 to 1949. Through a combination of tactics, Sardar Vallabhbhai Patel and V.P. Menon in the months immediately preceding and following the independence convinced the rulers of almost all of the hundreds of princely states to accede to India. In a speech in January 1948, Vallabhbhai Patel said, As you are all aware, on the lapse of paramountcy every Indian state became a separate independent entity and our first task of consolidating about 550 states was on the basis of accession to the Indian Dominion on three subjects. Barring Hyderabad and Junagadh all the states which are contiguous to India acceded to Indian Dominion. Subsequently, Kashmir also came in. Some rulers who were quick to read the writing on the wall, gave responsible government to their people, Cochin being the most illustrious example. In Travancore, there was a short struggle, but there, too, the ruler soon recognized the aspiration of his people and agreed to introduce a constitution in which all powers would be transferred to the people and he would function as a constitutional ruler. Although this process successfully integrated the vast majority of princely states into India, it was not as successful in relation to a few states, notably the former princely state of Kashmir, whose Maharaja delayed signing the instrument of accession into India until his territories were under the threat of invasion by Pakistan, the state of Hyderabad, whose ruler decided to remain independent and was subsequently defeated by the Operation Polo invasion. Having secured their accession, Sardar Patel and V.P. Menon then proceeded, in a step-by-step -step process, to secure and extend the central government's authority over these states and to transform their administrations until, by 1956, there was little difference between the territories that had formerly been part of British India and those that had been princely states. Simultaneously, the Government of India, through a combination of diplomatic and military means, acquired control over the remaining European colonial enclaves, such as Goa, which were also integrated into India. As the final step, in 1971, the 26th Amendment to the Constitution of India withdrew official recognition of all official symbols of princely India, including titles and privileges, and abolished the remuneration of the princes by privy purses. As a result, even titular heads of the former princely states ceased to exist. Topic: <inaudible> Pakistan. During the period of the British Raj, there were four princely states in Baluchistan: Makran, Karan, Las Bella, and Khalid. The first three acceded to Pakistan. However, the ruler of the fourth princely state, the Khan of Khalid Ahmad Yar Khan, declared Khalid's independence as this was one of the options given to all princely states. The state remained independent until it was acceded on 27 March 1948. 
The signing of the instrument of accession by Ahmad Yar Khan, led his brother, Prince Abdul Karim, to revolt against his brother's decision in July 1948, causing an ongoing and still unresolved insurgency. Bahawalpur from the Punjab Agency joined Pakistan on 5 October 1947. The princely states of the Northwest Frontier States Agencies, included the DIR SWAT and Chitral Agency and the Deputy Commissioner of Hazara acting as the political agent for AMB and Fulra. These states joined Pakistan on independence from the British. See also <laughs> <laughs> Notes <laughs>